National Research Council's Aquatic and Crop Research uh, Resource Development located here in Saskatoon. And I have the pleasure to serve uh, as chair of this session, uh, which is a research update. Uh, so for the interest of time, I will keep the introduction of the speakers very brief. You should be able to find more information about the background of the speakers online at the uh, uh, workshop or portal. Um, and also, um, we'll have our question period at the conclusion uh, of all the presentations at that time. I would ask the speakers to please come to front um, and, and have a Q&A. So without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Sonia uh, Wilson uh, to, from uh, Manitoba Canola Growers to kick off the presentation. Sonia, Sonia is the manager uh, at the Manitoba Canola Growers Association, and, and she will get us updated, up to date on Manitoba Canola Growers Research. Awesome. Well, hello, everyone. <clears throat> hello, everyone. My name is Sonia Wilson, and I'm here to give you an update on uh, Manitoba Canola Growers uh, research over the past year of 2022. And I am our term research manager while Amy DeLackey is on mat maternity leave. Maybe we can get the slide. OK, there we go. So just to give an overview, what is um, the purpose of our research program and what we focus on? So MCGA's research program is focusing on investing in programs and projects that match the priorities of our Manitoba canola farmers and provide a clear return on investment to our membership. So we have three areas that we do this, and that's profits, people, and the planet. And for profits, we're working towards improved and stable profits from our Manitoba canola acres. For people focusing on providing safe and manageable farm production options, and in terms of the planet, increasing the longevity and sustainability of Manitoba farmland. So to be able to do this, we have to know what the priorities are for our Manitoba farmers. So over the past year, Amy conducted a very extensive survey for our Manitoba canola farmers and identified what priorities do they have for research? What do they want to see? And what would support them with their on-farm decisions? So these six priorities that you see uh, came from that survey. And they are the framework that we use to evaluate all of our uh, projects and uh, program funding that we do. So I won't go through all of them, but they are available on our website as well if you want to reference. Uh, during 2022 and 2023, we also had research gaps uh, specifically that we wanted to fill. So I'll just highlight the three main ones, and those were flea beetle management strategies, optimizing fertility management, and improving, of course, yield stability with environmental extremes. So the first uh, initiative or program I wanted to highlight uh, that was new in this past year and we're really excited about uh, was our Manitoba Canola on Farm Research Program. And so this is in collaboration with the Manitoba Crop Alliance and Manitoba Pulse and Soybean Growers. And we brought canola um, to have an on-farm research component. So the aim of this program is to bridge the gap between traditional, traditional research and on-farm adoption of new and improved practices in Manitoba. So we had three different trial types that were run this year at different sites, and you can see them highlighted on the right there. And the first was a nitrogen rate trial. So what we did is we worked with farmers and looked at uh, what was their standard uh, nitrogen application rate, and then compared that with a reduced rate at 75% of their standard and a higher rate at 125%. Similar with the seeding rate, we looked at what was their um, standard seeding rate and then had the reduced at 75% of that and higher at 125%. Then we also had uh, antifungal bioinoculant trials as well. So by doing this and looking at what the on-farm results were, we actually were able to statistically compare um, if these different treatments had an effect on the final yield at each site as well as other parameters. And we're really looking forward to expanding the number of 
uh, trial types we run in this coming summer, as well as adding more site year data um, to our collection. The next program I want to highlight is also uh, started this past summer and was really exciting, and it was the Research Camp 2022. So the aim of this program was to encourage the highest quality of research focused on providing farm level value to growers across the province. And so how uh, this was done was having eight researchers who are involved in canola, but from many different disciplines, uh, come together to visit six different farms, uh, cross commodity farms over two days. And so the researchers got to see firsthand and talk with farmers on their farm about what production challenges that they face uh, in Manitoba. So we had three types of interactions that uh, we were really encouraging. Uh, researcher to farmer interactions directly, researcher to researcher interactions across many disciplines, and of course, uh, interactions between researcher and MCGA, uh, as we look to see how can farmers use research results that are coming out, and also what are the topics that have the potential to make the largest impact uh, on farm. So here are some of the topics that were covered during that research camp, and uh, you can see there are topics that are canola specific, but also many topics that just cover uh, on farm decisions um, in summary. So we're really looking forward to running this program again uh, in the coming summer uh, with new researchers and continuing to have dialogue about uh, these different topics. So we also have the whole farm committee that we're involved in, uh, and this is led by the Manitoba Crop Alliance, MCA, and also includes uh, Manitoba Pulse and Soybean Growers. So the aim of, for this committee is to look at research projects that allow for whole farm cross commodity approaches to researchers uh, to benefit Manitoba producers. So I've just highlighted uh, five uh, areas and priorities for this year, and we've received 12 letters of intent and are looking at seven projects at the full proposal stage at the moment. Finally, the last uh, initiative I would like to highlight is our Pest Surveillance Initiative, or PSI. As many of you know, it has the hashtag Get Tested program, and this covers free DNA-based testing for our MCGA membership. So you can see here on the right, it provides a lot of different testing services, and the uh, club root, black leg, and verticillium stripe testing are free for our MCGA members. So I really encourage if um, you're a farmer or you're an agronomist who has connections with uh, farmers to really encourage them to take use of this and provide uh, specific DNA-based testing for their fields. We also had specific research projects PSI was involved in over this last year. So that includes evaluating advanced club root pathotype bioassays focused on known Manitoba pathotypes, validating a smooth pigweed marker for testing, evaluating verticillium stripe tissue tests at the one to four leaf stage using the CFIA developed DNA markers, increasing fusarium wilt screening efforts and increasing our black leg race ID capacity. PSI also offers uh, glyphosate resistant kochia and tier one noxious amaranth species ID at a cost for our membership. So that is in a summary of our 2022 research program year. And I would really encourage if you'd like to chat or have any questions about our program or initiatives uh, for research for MCGA, uh, please find me during Canola Week. And uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Sonia. And our next speaker is Brittany Vischer. Um, Brittany uh, is uh, the research director for Alberta Can Canola Producers Commission. And Brittany will update us about canola, Alberta canola research. I have my timer because I have 16 slides and only eight minutes. Oh, there's one right there. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So yes, my name is Brittany Vischer and I'm the research director at Alberta Canola. And I'll be giving a brief update on the grow funded research projects happening on canola in Alberta. 
I'd like to start first with our research committee. Uh, you can see at the top there, John Mako, he's here with us today and he is the chair. He's been kept very busy. He sits on about eight to nine different boards to uh, advocate for canola growers in Alberta. <clears throat> Two newer faces, Christine McKee and Alan Hampton. They're our newest committee members and also our newest directors. And they're from Southern Alberta. So our research goals at Alberta Canola are very broad. And uh, I argue that so that we don't miss an opportunity for innovation. And they would uh, look at the find, finding solutions to pest management, finding the best way to grow canola, and increase the demand for canola through human health and nutrition specifically. So this year we focused on all three of meeting these goals. In our 2021 and 2022, we were able to uh, fund 12 new projects with the help of partners, which amounted to uh, just under $1.15 million. And we have a matching ratio of one to three. Now this is a bit lower this year, and this is because we looked at a new market development project. Typically we like to see this ratio around one to six or one to eight. Um, <clears throat> but this year we did have a lot of CARP projects of which I'll go through quickly, along with a few uh, projects through the Agriculture Funding Consortium, which is the funding, provincial funding body within Alberta. So at the bottom right there, it says denotes a CARP funded research project, which I'm sure most of you cannot read. Uh, there's also a blue asterisk that I've put beside projects that are uh, looking at, that are CARP funded, so duly joint, uh, jointed, jointly funded, excuse me. So looking at fine solutions to pest management, looking at weeds to start, so updating the critical weed free period in canola, screening false cleavers uh, for quinchloric and glyphosate resistance, and I didn't realize this counting down, so that's way more helpful. <laughs> Moving on to diseases. So two of these are funded through CARP. The ones that were funded through AFC specifically looked at club root, and I wanted to highlight that a lot of the, the funding dollars at Alberta Canola are focused on, um, have been dedicated to disease research uh, due to club roots. So it takes up a large uh, portion of our funding. Moving on to insects, both of these again were fun funded through CARP, but they're looking at the heat and drought on canola, the pollinator interactions and crop yield, and then a different uh, to develop and assess different strategies to reduce the impact of pollen be beetle, which could be a new invasive pest within the prairies. Moving on to our second goal, finding the best ways to grow canola. These are both CARP funded projects again, yet I wanted to highlight the top one as, this, as Alberta Canola is a solo funder of this project. It's how does fall applied nitrogen fertilizer influence soil emitted nitrous oxide emissions during the overwinter and spring thaw period in the cement area prairies. The second one is also looking at greenhouse gas emissions um, through climate smart canola. Now I've talked about the market development project that we had. Uh, looked at this last year and we just recently funded it here in the summer and this is the metabolic and inflammatory outcomes of the ketogenic diet comparing saturated and unsaturated fat sources it's a fairly large project uh, just under eight hundred thousand dollars and that was a 50 50 split with our third party uh, government funding institution within alberta the results res results driven agricultural research or ardar for short so this is what uh, contributed to our lower funding ratio I wanted to touch on the living labs. I'm not sure how many people have heard of the living labs, but I think each province is going to be getting one here pretty quick if you haven't already. So this is a proposal submitted to AAFC through the Agricultural Climate Solutions Funding Program. The Alberta Beef Producers was the one submitting the proposal, and Alberta Canola is a funding partner. So the Alberta Agri-Systems Living Lab, or the AALL, will measure the impacts of beneficial management pra practices on farm under real world production conditions. It will work in partnership with researchers, serv service provider providers, and other uh, egg stakeholders. So when you look at what the focus is, again, this is highlighting emissions, but looking at just best management practices for overall efficiency for crop production systems and livestock. So this would include land use changes, livestock feeding, grazing management, optimizing carbon storage, crop sy systems and rotations, to name a few. <clears throat> so when you look at, we can find this in our annual report, which is just released. Uh, you can get one if you come to our 
AGM. This is our funding and core research area since 2012. Again, as I mentioned, the disease taking up a large portion of our funding. And you'll see there on the bottom right, our leverage or our ratios is around six. Beyond our research projects, we have just started a collaborative effort with Alberta Paul Sparley and Wheat Commission, and this is called the Research and Mentorship Program. So our vision was to provide crop researchers with opportunities to develop their understanding of commercial barley, canola, pulse, and wheat production systems, and to heighten the relevance of grower-funded research projects for on-farm adoption. So there's three components to this program. We had our one-on-one -on -one mentorship program, the reverse agronomy update, and then the supplemental tours. So for the mentorship program, we had matched up researchers with farmers within their geographic area, and we had them observe and absorb the intricacies of large-scale operations within Alberta. So we had Dr. Haley Catton out of AAFC Lethbridge paired with Kevin Surface, Dr. Hiroshi Kubota out of AAFC Lacombe paired with Justin Bell, and Dr. Linda Gorham out of the University of Alberta paired with Wayne Schneider. We encourage them to visit the farm as often as possible, but at least four times, one through uh, seeding, scouting, and crop spraying, and then at harvest. Looking at the reverse agronomy update, some researchers in the room might have attended this. It was open to 40 researchers to hear from farmers about the logistics within the spring and uh, summer planning of farming. Followed up with supplemental tours. We were able to take some research out to an egg retail in Fort Saskatchewan at Nutrien, as well as a seed cleaning facility in Fort Saskatchewan at Galloway Seeds. So moving on to 2022 and 2023, we just completed our full proposal research meeting. About $8.5 million was requested, and uh, Alberta Canola's budget is, is a fraction of that, around $1 million. So we have a lot of really great proposals coming in. We'll be making those decisions soon before Christmas break. And then, of course, the Canola Agri-Science cluster, of which I'm sure we're all familiar with, and Canola Council has been working very hard with that. So with 20 seconds left, I'd like to say thank you to all the funding partners, Prairie Canola Groups, Prairie Crop Groups, RDR, WGF, Innotech, as well as the Canola Council of Canada and all those on the Canola Week Committee. Seven seconds. Killed it. Thank you so much, Brittany. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Doug Heath. Um, Doug is uh, the research manager at the Saskatchewan uh, Canola Development Commission. Doug will report updates from the Saskatchewan Canola Development Com Commission research. Great, thanks a lot, Jitao. Um, yeah, I'm Doug Heath from South Canola, I'm the research manager. And so we, we partner with several national and provincial initiatives to uh, support research for the benefit of 20,000 uh, canola growers in Saskatchewan. So, so this morning I just want to talk about, very briefly, introduce 11 new ADF projects that started earlier this year. And so SAS Canola's research program has three, um, three priorities. So the first one is agronomy-based agronomy research, as well as pre-breeding trait development, and as well as um, research that supports uh, new product development and new, new uses of oil and meal. Uh, so for the 11 ADF projects that we funded last year, uh, the first theme would be uh, disease. So that's, that's an important um, research area that we fund. Uh, so the first one is um, led by Adele Perez Lopez, uh, understanding uh, um, NLR mediated club root resistance. So NLR is, is um, nucleotide binding leucine rich repeats. And this, this particular feature allows uh, bait libraries to be produced. Um, and that those can be used to pull out leucine-rich um, regions of the genome. And it's also thought that a lot of club root resistance genes are, are, are these NLR genes. So they'll, they'll be looking at um, 
comparing those between uh, resistant and sensitive um, varieties. Uh, the second one is led by Wei Zhao from the U of S. So in, in previous work, they identified over 1,800 uh, differentially expressed genes between resistant and susceptible cultivars mm -hmm. after a club root in infection. And so this group is also developing a high throughput CRISPR platform. So this will be able to edit up to 150 genes at the same time. And so they'll be able to validate um, these differentially expressed genes as well as gene families by doing this massively parallel gene editing. And so that'll also be a useful tool for the rest of the research committee for future collaborations. Now the third project is led by Hussein Borhan from AAFC. And so he'll be looking at uh, genome sequences of, of uh, canola intergression lines that contain either the RLM1 or RLM11 uh, black leg resistance genes. And so by comparing resistant and susceptible alleles, uh, they will be able to develop CAST markers for uh, evaluating and identifying resistance genes in existing germplasm. All right, so the next theme I want to talk about is uh, 4R fertility. And we have three projects in, in there as well. So the first one is uh, led by Renald Lemke. So this is going to be looking at response curves of both urea and dual inhibitor and fertilizers. And to determine uh, at which point um, you get to the maximum um, emission, uh, nitro uh, nitrous oxide emissions reduction. So this will allow, allow producers to determine the optimal blend ratios of, of urea to uh, enhance nitrogen efficiency uh, fertilizers. And then all at the same time, maintaining optimal yields for both canola and wheat. Uh, the next one's led by Blake Wiseth, who's doing some work at Discovery Farms. So this project will evaluate the impact of topography and different 4R practices on nitrogen and phosphate uptake by, by the crop and looking at levels in runoff water. So they'll be looking at both snow melt runoff as well as um, in-season runoff. So they collect every runoff event. Uh, the third one is uh, led by Havan Tedla at AFC. Uh, so they'll be looking at different um, variable rate field zone delineation methods and comparing that to, the, to determine the optimal rates of urea or enhanced effic efficiency nitrogen fertilizer sources for each zone in the field for both canola and wheat crops. And then developing economic models uh, to determine which um, VR field zones are the most profitable or potentially have risk when adopting a, virtual, a, a variable rate technology. And the next theme deals with soil health. So we funded two projects from Bobby Halkison at the U of S. Um, so these are two related projects. And the first will use uh, N15 labeled urea and carbon-13 labeled CO2 to trace how much nitrogen and carbon uh, become available from the previous crop residue decomposition and how much of that is taken up by, by the following crop. And the second project um, is closely related, but it's looking at the stability of the soil carbon in samples from long-term wheat and canola-based rotations. And so sequestration of soil carbon is heavily dependent on the uh, soil microbial community uh, makeup. So they'll be looking at mic microbial abundance, community species diversity, and the metabolic activity rates. And then they'll use that to determine how uh, soil organic, organic carbon is either stably sequestered or is uh, vulnerable to decomposition and release of CO2. Uh, we also have um, some abiotic stress. Uh, so that's led by Mark Smith from AFC. Um, previously, um, his group was able to determine that Brassica napis has a low variation in the, the types and abundances of surface waxes in the cuticle. And so by, by looking at gene edited lines in several metabolic path pathways for, for wax synthesis, 
uh, they're, they're hoping to find new variants in um, wax composition and potentially um, by having the same level of wax in the cuticle but with a different compositional makeup um, uh, trying to determine if if a different composition of wax can pr improve drought tolerance without having a yield penalty such as you would have if um, if the plant is making more wax and we have um, pollinator health as well it's led by Elamir Simcoe from the U of S so they'll be taking samples of honey pollen bees and soil and uh, analyzing analyzing them through um, a mass spectrometry panel of over 90 different pesticides and then uh, evaluating uh, colony health factors including uh, different diseases uh, they'll be looking for correlations between colony health and the concentrations of, of various pesticides either individually or different combinations of pesticides and the, and the, the last ADF um, project I want to talk about is on, on harvest optimization and that's to be led by Lauren Greger from PAMI and so on average canola harvest losses are estimated at, at nearly six percent and the combining efficiency um, changes over the course of the harvest day depending on the ambient conditions uh, so they're going they're going to be comparing the auto adjust performance on different uh, combine systems and looking at seed loss over changing daily conditions and I'm out of time so I just wanted to introduce this topic as well uh, using hyperspectral imaging for detecting and mapping club root patches that's um, that's a project that's in progress so looking forward to seeing some preliminary results led by David Halstead out of uh, South Polytech and collaborating with Bruce Gosson and Mary Ruth McDonald so I'm out of time so I really just wanted to introduce these proposals or not proposals they're actually projects um, so that we know what's going on before and we just don't hear about things at, at the end when the projects are over and that's just a small subset of the projects that we fund so I encourage you to look at SAS Canola's research results page for for more projects there that are ongoing and completed and as well as uh, Canola Council of Canada's research hub and the, um, the Canola Digest Science Edition so thanks a lot Thank you, Doug. Um, our next speaker is Chris Anderson, who is General Manager of DL Seeds. Uh, Chris will speak about DL Seeds and new leadership. Good morning, everyone. All right, Let's see if we can get this going. No slides? I could do it without slides. Uh, so, uh, as you heard, I'm the general manager of DL. I'll get to that in a second. Uh, but I thought I'd take a couple minutes this morning to, uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with DL, to give you a bit of an introduction and spend a little bit of time talking about what's new inside our research program. And so, uh, in the beginning, uh, so way back in uh, 2008, uh, DL Seeds was created uh, as, as an amalgamation of the research activities of DSV Canada and NBZ. And so those two organizations had independent canola research programs that were brought together. And so across those heritage programs and the work of DL today, uh, that's more than 27 years in, in the Canadian industry and DL operating as DL Seeds for more than 14 years now. Our uh, main research locations are in Morden, uh, Manitoba, and in, uh, in just outside of Winnipeg. And just before you think that that uh, facility there is all DL seeds, uh, we occupy the, the research building uh, highlighted in yellow there, where you can see the greenhouses, et cetera. We have a great partnership uh, on Brett Young's facility there. Um, our, uh, our staff consists of 32 people now. Uh, we have three canola breeders, a, uh, a pulse breeder, uh, 19 research staff, we have a production team, uh, we obviously have finance and HR, and of course, pure overhead in the form of a general manager. 
Uh, we uh, I'll just uh, give you a, a quick anecdote about the picture. We had a little uh, team celebration with a Western theme, and so no, we don't usually wear cowboy hats at work. But I will confess, there was a shocking number of people that didn't look that different uh, when we dressed up. Uh, but uh, so DL has two parent uh, company shareholders. One is NPZ, uh, so a well-known company in, in the global OSR and canola community that just celebrated 125 years uh, in plant breeding and seed sales. Uh, they're a family-owned company integrated right through uh, from all aspects of breeding and development through to uh, production and sales. Uh, their strongest focus is certainly on winter canola, but also on, on uh, pulses and forages with more than 200 employees around the world. Our other key shareholder is DSV, which is a farmer owned organization. Uh, again, also an integrated company, uh, also based in Germany. Uh, they have a more diverse offering of crops that they work on, uh, including forages, cereals, maize, turf grass, and certainly OSR. A uh, much uh, larger company with over 700 employees now. Why would I tell you that? Well, because this is important in terms of the overall effort that goes into uh, the, the research here at DL Seeds. And so both NBZ and DSV have a very strong history of collaboration. And in fact, the two of them even partner in uh, many countries in Europe uh, to market the products that they independently develop through a common marketing arm called Rapool. And so that integration of the two businesses, they both compete as well as collaborate, really brings a, lot, a much bigger research impact to the DL program. So while we have three, L, three uh, canola breeders within the DL program, we really get to leverage the expertise, the germplasm, the innovations of, of more programs, of four programs based around the globe. So really uh, the effect of really 16 breeders uh, lending a hand to move, move our products forward. So breeding targets, uh, this would be probably not very different than any other applied canola program out there. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about it. I think I saw Dale Burns in the back. He and I used to have a, a long joke about there's really only three priorities for a breeding program and that's yield, yield, and yield because that's really what, uh, what our farmer customers ultimately want to see. But we all know here in the room, canola is a challenging crop. Uh, we've heard lots about the demand. Uh, for canola, uh, so an expectation of not just increased acres, but increased productivity. And so what has to come along with that yield potential is obviously the things that help protect it around disease resistant, about agronomic adaptation and quality as well. So what's a little bit different about DL seeds, maybe compared to some other programs. Uh, and so we're, uh, as far as I know, the only company that's commercializing uh, canola hybrids based on two different hybridization systems. Uh, both the MSL system and the Ogura system. We have an active development program on uh, all three herbicide tolerance systems being TrueFlex, uh, Liberty Link, and, and the Clearfield system. Uh, and I think that also ties to where uh, our program is not connected to uh, a larger uh, trait development uh, uh, program. And so what we're looking to do is partner with trait developers to bring the best traits forward with the best germplasm. Uh, collaboration is really important, as you saw about our shareholders, and so collaboration across the breeding programs, not just with those organizations that I mentioned, being NPZ and DSV, but also with other parties to really look for maximum efficiencies and, and, and the ways to move innovation forward uh, faster. Our, again, our approach to market, a little different than many other private companies, our focus is on the research. And so what we wanna do is focus purely on the breeding uh, uh, work, uh, developing great new hybrids for, for Western Canadian conditions and partner with key organizations to really build out those capabilities in the sales and marketing uh, and the production arenas. And so we don't have a direct to, to farmer brand. What we do is license germplasm to great brands like Brett Young and Canterra and others that uh, take those, that, those genetics to market. So what's new? Uh, well, so people-wise, uh, a, a new GM, so I'm new, uh, about seven months now, uh, a massive tenure with DL Seeds. Uh, there's a, a kind of a running joke. There's someone in our, our uh, greenhouse group that started a month before me and every team meeting we have, she clearly reminds me that she has more seniority than I do. Uh, but uh, so we've got a great group. 
Kevin McCallum in the bottom uh, of the screen there, many of you probably know Kevin was a great uh, member, uh, still is a great member of the canola community, but he's retired from DL Seeds, so you can also call me the new Kevin if you like. Uh, but we have been growing our team both in terms of agronomists to build out our, our uh, testing footprint across Western Canada and, and building out new capabilities uh, by adding a research scientist position to complement the work of our breeders. Uh, what else is new? So we're making investments in facilities. So our Morden Research Facility, uh, we have added an addition onto it that's really aimed specifically at handling stewarded traits. And so we've added uh, six new growth rooms that all have uh, a separate vestibule, a separate seed storage area uh, to keep all the work that goes on within those uh, chambers separate from the rest of the facility. Uh, they're state-of-the-art LED lighting, uh, flood bench uh, watering. Uh, they're just uh, fantastic new uh, growth rooms. And that's really a reflection that we think that not only do we have uh, access to the traits that are in the marketplace today, but we think as uh, new technologies, uh, gene edited traits, et cetera, become available, uh, we would be very well positioned to uh, handle that material uh, simultaneously with our ongoing development program. Uh, we've been working hard on pod shattering resistance. Uh, we're commercializing products now uh, that have, uh, I think, great pod shattering resistance, and we've made a lot of progress in understanding the functioning of that trait uh, in our germplasm. And we really see opportunities for enhancing this further where we can see, we believe we'll see the durability in terms of the length of time that that pod shattering trait uh, it, uh, persists in the field to really increase and, and provide a lot of benefit to, to farmers longer term. Uh, we've implemented, uh, we've gone from kind of marker assisted selection to genome wide selection and, and really implementing uh, prediction in our program as well. And this is again where we see some of those benefits of having partnerships with uh, our, our shareholder breeding programs with, with NPZ and DSV. Inside our shop, we're generating about 700,000 data points a year uh, in terms of genomic analysis work. We're generating something like 20 million data points a year, and we're already in, uh, deploying prediction models in terms of advancing uh, traits through our pipeline and selecting germplasm uh, before it even gets out to the field. So it's been a great step forward for, for our program. And then I would be uh, remiss if I didn't, I know this is a canola meeting, but uh, I do want to remind everyone that we do also have an active uh, breeding program in, uh, in pulses, so green peas, yellow peas, uh, and fava beans. And uh, that's, uh, that's work that, again, uh, we're able to leverage our relationship with Europe. And as we discuss about the, the demand for fuel and uh, oil, and I think we'll hear more about protein, uh, crop rotation and other crops availability is certainly important to canola growers as well. And so with that, I will cap it off early. Probably never happened in a presentation I've given before, but uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Chris. Um, our next uh, presentation will be from a Matthew, Matthew uh, Rizvi. Uh, Matthew is general manager of NR, NRG Canada, and his topic uh, today is creating the future of agriculture by maximizing the power of genomics. Thank you, Zidu. Um, I think everybody has raised the bar so high that it's a lot of pressure. And then thank you, organization committee, for putting me just before the lunch. Uh, this is also a pressure, but I will try to finish um, everything before time. And thanks, Chris. Give me extra time. Um, we we are a company uh, based in uh, uh, Innovation Place. We started in 2020. Um, our parent company, uh, we are fully subsidiary uh, owned by Narjeen in Israel. Um, this company uh, is started in 2010 in Israel, Tel Aviv, and then um, decided to open in 2020 uh, office and subsidiary in Narjeen as Narjeen Canada in Saskatoon. This is the time when the pandemic was hitting hard, like in March, we got the pandemic and then 
me, we started this company and I joined as a general manager of the company, working from home for almost like six months before we go and settle down in innovation place. Now we have 17 full-time staff in R&D and uh, we do work on uh, Canola P Hemp and also we have a genotyping service lab, uh, which is working on uh, providing cheaper, better and faster solution. We have some uh, industry, local and global experts uh, on the this crop, not only just this crop, but also on the genomic service pipeline. We have worked with many industry partners uh, and an academic institution locally in Canada. Um, the, our, our major focus is like to local routes in, in Saskatchewan, in Paris, in Canada. And then our thought was like to, how do we understand the challenges? We are the largest grower for wheat, lentil, canola, uh, pea, oat, and there is so much going on there as, as everybody said, like yield, 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 but the yield is not the only thing. We are looking for diseases pressure. We're looking for pot shattering. We are looking for so many other traits, which are really important for the crops. So these are the things which is challenges. So now our our point is like how we do this as a solution uh, towards applying the genomics or deploying the genomics as soon as possible and put the things into the technology to the product which can reach to the market as soon as possible. Uh, we started with the bread wheat. Uh, I, I don't know like if you guys uh, notice in 2016, the Energene was the company who published the uh, wheat genome, hexaploid wheat genome. And then uh, two years back, uh, we did the first canola pan genome, which where we included 12 lines. So this was with the help of industry and then some of the academic institution. And then we are also working on a P and HAMP, which is a project funded from the Protein Industry Canada. Uh, canola Pan genome project was really a key for um, uh, redefining the genomics for canola. Uh, we were having a lot of a struggle because uh, there was only uh, one public line on spring, one public line on the winter canola, and there was not uh, so much. There was companies who were having their own own genomics or reference assembly. So we decided to go uh, with the three or four industry partners and also with the academic institution, AFC and GIFS and uh, did 12 genome, which was six on the winter and six on the spring side to really make sure that there is a de novo level assembly available and you can understand more traits and do the gene mapping and then the DNA variant calling uh, will be will be really easy. What we did after this, having this uh, information, uh, we started doing the uh, haplotype database, which is like looking for the diversity uh, more in canola and how we can build a haplotype database. And this database will come to a point where we can um, develop a SNP chip, which is like a low cost SNP chip. But to do that, we need to have a lab. And we open a lab in October 2021 in Innovation Place, which is basically doing DNA extraction and doing the Amplicon based sequencing, which is very, very cheaper as other platforms available right now. So as, as we know, uh, the genotyping is really like high cost, complex and logistically. Uh, there is a, a lab, centralized lab everywhere in the world and then we try to ship the DNA. We did for, um, uh, for a very long time in my previous life. And uh, this is also time intensive and then cost and after pandemic things are changing for the logistic. So there, this was our one of the point to have it locally where the canola grows and then lab. Uh, right away, which can provide the cheaper, better, and faster solution. Uh, the one of the thing why it's important to discuss here for the pan genome and then detection of diversity, because it's like a stepwise thing. So you make a, a recipe. It's like a starting with the chopping the vegetable. We did the pan genome, then detection of the diversity, and after that, doing the optimized SNP set, uh, which is a minimum SNP set. We call it a Canola SNP Pro. Um, and this can be utilized for a very cheap cost for genotyping, and it could be still imputed for the larger amount of the SNPs. So it's like a next level of uh, genotyping where you can do the high accurate genotyping, which is cheaper, but still you can get a data which is the high density data. So what we call 
uh, there is a product which called as a canola snip pro uh, is basically 500 flux and this this all comes from the previous slide where we did optimization based on the diversity so this canola snip pro is 500 snips which is basically selected based on uh, having the diversity in canola which is spring and winter both and some of the australian germplasm for sure um, so it represents uh, everything in the canola diversity. What we did, we minimized everything which is not polymorphic, uh, more, more, uh, which is not a polymorphic. And also like some of the uh, SNPs which were reduced based on the, based on the, uh, the information we were having in the background, like those SNPs are either not annotated or having a type three or having a homologous or homologous region on the canola. Um, so this is basically to give a cost saving. Um, so the cost is very, very cheap as, uh, as you have any other genotyping is cost will be like five times cheaper than, uh, than the, any other tools available for genotyping. Uh, the one of the thing, what we, we are talking here is, uh, doing this is especially for the quality. This is one of the top things breeder wants. So the data has to be quality wise, informativeness should be there, the end to end stability should be there and then cost. So the operation side always uh, look for the low cost and then turn around time. So these are the few things we are trying to do. We enhance the quality, we enhance the uh, consistency, but at the other point, we also uh, decrease the turnaround time and the cost uh, per sample. So as I mentioned, this is like a salient point, um, uh, low cost, uh, maximize the genotypic data, and then uh, doing the high quality. Our quality rate is around 98% as compared to the running the big uh, SNP chip, like uh, Lumina SNP chips, if you want to run 60K versus ours, we have around 95 or more than 95 accuracy. And it's a faster turnaround time. Like, so there is a, it's a local, we grow canola most of the prairies and it is local so to faster turnaround time our turnaround time currently is for the depend upon the what kind of projects so we can always accommodate uh, based on those uh, breeding needs so this is a tool um, we we saw like this is very important tools to really not just for applying to the larger breeding but also like to do this uh, trade development and we did some internal project, which is one of the thing we, we just, I'm hearing club root is a very, very important uh, trait for canola. So what we did, um, uh, we have uh, gathered some information about the canola and then uh, this picture has been taken from canola council, how this uh, um, club root area is increasing uh, from 2003, uh, 2011 and now 2019, it's spreading entire Alberta and now in the, into the Saskatoon and it become major threat. And the farm gate income is based on like how much the severity we, we get for the canola. So one year it could be less severity because of the drought or uh, no moisture, but another year with the moisture, this is a fungal disease, it can really do the outbreak. So it's not a matter of if, if a matter of when we want to have the durable resistance into canola. And uh, our goal was to really do look for the new genetic material and it's hard to really bring the new genetic material as club root resistance mostly come from the winter lines and it's hard to integrate those lines so we were trying to really look for the multiple sources do the pyramiding and then do the um, faster integration based on the canola snip pro uh, what what we have our project line is really like uh, as, as you can see that like we have a divided the project into the different stages uh, stage uh, we have completed a stage one and two we partner with the university of alberta for doing a lot of testing in there which is like a most uh, time consuming job uh, and then we are currently doing the genetic mapping and also we are doing the trait integration uh, work which has just started so once this is, uh, th there is some results which we uh, we received from the University of Alberta. So as you can see, like we we tested some of the lines, uh, which is uh, uh, in here, and then uh, we tested only three A and five X uh, because uh, because of the time limitation. But we are doing more pathotype testing on our donor, and we found donor A and B were highly resistant here, 
And this is this picture showing like there is a no gal formation for donor A and B, and the result basically showing the same thing index of the diseases. Donor A is having uh, almost zero uh, disease index. Donor B is a little bit around uh, two percent uh, for pathotype three A, not for pathotype five X. Second project, what we are um, handling, which is basically a high protein content, and I'm talking about seed, not the meal protein here. Here, um, our target is actually to increase the protein from 24% uh, to 32%, and we are talking more about the soluble protein. Uh, so I, I know like it's, it's always difficult, like how much protein you have in canola seed, but uh, most important is, is the extrusion of the, those protein from the canola meal uh, to, to uh, usable protein. And, so we are talking about the soluble protein, which is more interesting uh, rather than talking the wholesome protein. But here the data shows uh, or the improved things shows 32%, which is a total protein in, a, in the seed. We are still testing for the meal and extrusion and those kind of things. What we are uh, thinking about increasing the protein percentage in the seed, but at the same time we will decrease the fiber content and maintain the oil content same. Because uh, if I go and tell farmers like, yeah, you will get 5% in increase in protein, but your oil will be dropped 5%, they will kill me for sure. Uh, so we don't want to say that. So the, one of the final thing I want to say here is uh, we, we are creating a value uh, addition to the prairies and the canola. Uh, we are working on other crops as well, but canola is one of the most important crop. 1995, when I published my first paper on canola or rapeseed, somebody said like, you put your heart in canola and canola will never leave your heart. And after 27 years, uh, that seems to be true. Um, so one of the things we want to say, like we are here to do the technology deployment as quick as possible, bring it to the commercialization as quick as possible, and see like how this technology can really uh, bring uh, major challenges like club root or pot shattering and other traits. Like I'm not saying just these are the two traits, like there is a black lug, there is a uh, yield, uh, yield, yield uh, how much bushel uh, you want to know. Uh, so those kind of things are already there, but uh, one of the things we w really want to bring on the table is it's a data driven, it's a breeding by design, not by breeding by uh, selection. Um, so one of the competitive landscape, we, we can say like there are many of the sequencing center, they do wet lab, uh, but they really don't provide other things, which is molecular breeding or the computational or, or, or cloud computing. But uh, we are here locally available. We provide almost like entire things, uh, which is which can be uh, good for the accelerated canola breeding or accelerated breeding in any other crop. Um, so final thing is to actually drive the innovation or deliver the result faster, cheaper or better. Uh, one of the thing what I hear in all the program is the cost saving and how you do the cost saving by implementing the technology as quick as possible or deploy the technology as quick as possible into the breeding program. So we are here, we are ready. I think I saved six minutes, I'm done here. If there is a question, my team is here as well. Thank you. Thanks, Mesu. Uh, thank you to all speakers who have given us so much valuable information within a very limited presentation time. And uh, as a result of this, so it allows us to have uh, some QA. Uh, I would like now invite the speakers to step up to the, to the podium and open the floor for questions from audience uh, here as well as online, if there are any. Uh, Do I see any questions from the floor? No. Oh, kiss, please. Um, I'd like to ask uh, about the Manitoba uh, farm experimental uh, plots and so on. Uh, part of this comes from I think uh, farmers uh, tending to wonder 
whether small plot uh, research is really telling them what's happening on the farm. Uh, we did this a number of years ago uh, with regard to yield and uh, showed that although uh, the actual yield numbers for the farm versus the small plot were different, the um, varietal uh, uh, performance was the same uh, in terms of uh, what those varieties showed on the farm and in the small plot. So I'm, I'm wondering whether you've considered uh, maybe doing some small plot um, demonstrations alongside the full farm, um, uh, farmer uh, conducted research uh, to perhaps uh, clarify for producers that the small plot uh, is um, directly applicable to the farm. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Yeah, so um, definitely uh, we can chat some more as well, um, Dr. Yanni, but our on-farm program, I guess the real aim of it over this past year and it being the inaugural year was, um, yeah, having the on-farm uh, trials and seeing what agronomic practices um, look like in terms of being on farm in that uh, sense. So that really is the aim of that initiative. But I definitely uh, agree that looking at small plot in uh, different uh, ways could be something we look at in the future. But for our first year, for sure, we want to really see on farm and look at different parameters and uh, partner as well with Manitoba Crop Alliance and MPSG in their uh, similar program as well for canola, bringing that forward. That answers your question. Thank you. For audiences participating uh, virtually, uh, don't forget you have the option of submitting questions online. Yeah, I will ask my colleague uh, Mark Smith to read out some of the questions uh, submitted virtually. Okay. I think I've messed up the microphone, sorry about that. Uh, we have a question online, which has received quite a lot of votes, so we'll start with that one. It's a question for the grower associations. So how do you determine the balance of using grower funds for applied versus fundamental research? Uh, well, I'll start off by talking about uh, trait development, let's say. So pre-breeding trait development, I think it's really important for um, to level the playing field between the small breeder, small breeders and large breeding companies. Uh, so developing consortia that are helping to, f to fund uh, trait, trait discovery as, as well as farmers. So everybody is helping to pay for this um, fundamental research. And then after after the traits are discovered, it's still very expensive to incorporate those traits into commercial varieties. So at that point, the, the commercial breeding companies are spending a lot of money as well to develop the new the new varieties. So that's how that's how I justify it. So we take it by a year by year basis, looking what opportunities come up. And we really lean on our research committee to figure out um, find that balance, but we don't have a set balance or ratio per year to determine that. Um, always looking for new opportunities, but being realistic of what our capacity is as well in, in, the, in the, that role. Yes, I would echo um, very similar that it's really what are, as I mentioned, we have uh, six uh, farmer based research priorities and looking and evaluating again yearly, what are the projects that are coming up and how can we support uh, those priorities and what our research committee is bringing forward that are the priorities um, and that yeah, about is our balance um, between. Thank you. Are there? Other questions online or yes, 
Um, there's a second question, and this one's for Masood and for Chris. What is the likelihood in the future that canola could be modified to be a non-host or immune to club root? That's a tough one. Okay, so I will take this question. I think it's uh, about uh, not about us uh, who can determine this. It's about the pathogen who is changing uh, based on the uh, based on the variant as changing or the. But yeah, I think the one of the thing what we are trying to really look is a durable resistance, which means like a, a one resistance which is basically very broad, uh, not just for this specific one, but also like a newer one in consideration. Just like we do the vaccine things, like it's like a lottery you do for the flu vaccine for the next year by having the data. So there, there is a lot more data mining which is which is required. We are still trying to work on those things, and then. The, the one of the big trouble here in Saskatchewan, we cannot test them, right? We have to send them to University of Alberta, and this is like a very time consuming um, uh, things to test them uh, phenotypically. But I will say like, I cannot say when, but yeah, there will be a future when there will be um, immune club plants or smart plants, which are basically changing their uh, immunity based on the environment where they are growing. You want to add something? Do you have anything? No, I, th I think. No, you cannot. Uh, I, well, I think Masood has hit the most important part. We don't know when. I think the the new tools that we have to drive breeding forward are going to create new opportunities for us for disease resistance, whether it's club root, black leg, or diseases we're not even facing today. Uh, really, what it comes down to is how fast can we do that versus how fast uh, the pathogen continues to change. Thank you. I think. Uh... We need to wrap up the Q and A, and thank you so much. And I don't forget, and uh, to make usage of the conference app, that you can continue to submit questions and messaging the speakers directly uh, if you can and you have uh, further questions. And I would like to thank the speakers again for contributing to the Kistani um, undergraduate scholarship at the University of Saskatchewan in lieu of speakers' gift. Um, Thank you again for uh, your participation and uh, your excellent talk and uh, participation in Q&A. Thank you. Um, so before we uh, break uh, for lunch, I'd like to call uh, up uh, today's uh, uh, lunch sponsor, BASF, and I'd like to call on uh, Russell Tristrak from uh, uh, BAF to say a few words. <laughs>